Hans Deval, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so I have a very simple question to start off with. Um, why should we study primates uh, to understand human society and human behavior? What is it that we can understand about ourselves by studying these cognate species? Well, we are primates. Um, and we're so close to some of the primates like uh, chimpanzees and bonobos that there's even people feel who that they need to be in the same genus, the genus Homo or the genus Pan. They're very closely related. And so I would say that socio-emotionally, we are basically the same as the other primates. I don't think there's a huge difference in our emotional life, social life, how we strive for success and how we, we value social relationships and, and so on. Cognitively, there's there's maybe a bit of a difference. I know some some people exaggerate it and make it a huge difference. I think the differences are not so great. But yes, uh, we have language, for example. I consider that an important difference. But overall, we are primates. And so looking at the other primates, we learn a little bit about primate psychology, which is also our psychology. So, so I think it places our psychology more in an evolutionary context than we're used to. And I think that's very valuable. What are some basic mistakes that human beings tend to make because they don't look at these other primate species and so they make assumptions about how they're special or assumptions about how their psychology works that could easily be debunked by studying chimpanzees, bonobos and other kinds of species? Yeah. I think the most common assumption is that if you look at the other primates, you see instinct. People will say that. If, if I say, for example... Um, there's political behavior in the chimpanzees and they say, oh, that means it's instinctive. So they think in the other primates, you see instinct. And if you look at humans, you see culture, more culture than biology, actually. Uh, I think that's a big mistake because if you look at the other primates, you see also culture. Uh, for example, the chimpanzee is adult when they're 16. So they have a very slow development. They learn a lot of things in their lifetime before they are adult. And we know that there's a lot of cultural habits that they have. So if you look at the other primates, you see also culture. And if you look at humans, you see also a lot of biology. So I think that's the biggest mistake is that people think that in animals, things must be simple and instinctive. And, and I think nothing is simple, especially not in the great apes. Um, so uh, that, I think that's the biggest mistake. Uh, so, so tell one... me a little bit about those cultural differences. Yeah. If, if I was skeptical of this point and, and you'd want to illustrate it, you know, what are the kind of cultural differences you get between one group of chimpanzees uh, in one cultural context and a different group of chimpanzees, uh, you know, living elsewhere? Well, the most basic one is that they cannot survive without the culture. So if you take, for example, captive chimpanzees or captive monkeys, for that matter, and you release them in the forest, they're going to die. They're going to die because they don't know what to eat. They don't know what dangers to avoid. They don't know how to orient themselves. Um, they, they are just hopeless and helpless. <laughs> and so uh, culture is, is absolutely essential for their survival. There's a lot of things that they eat that they learn from each other or how to process them, like cracking nuts. So, for example, cracking nuts is a good example. There are chimpanzees who have nuts in the forest and stones in the forest and don't do anything with them. And there are other chimpanzee groups where they have stones and nuts and they, they crack the nuts with stones and they have a, a lot of extra food that way because it, nuts are a very valuable food source. So that, that's one cultural difference. You, there's tons of them documented in all sorts of species, not just the primates, also in whales and, and, and birds, of course, the bird song is, is cultural. So, so people assume that what you see in nature is biology, but what you see in nature is also often cultural. Uh, so that example is really interesting. I just want to understand it better. So um, is that nearly like a kind of technological innovation? One group of chimpanzees has figured out how to use stones to crack those nuts and the other chimpanzees haven't haven't tried to do so, uh, managed to do so. And, and to what extent does culture equal variation? Because this just seems like, uh, you know, it's just to the advantage of chimpanzees to be able to crack nuts in this kind of way. And, and, and it's sort of, you could think about it in a sort of linear yes. progress model, right? Like one group of chimpanzees mm -hmm. is further ahead from the other because they've cracked this puzzle in a way that the others haven't. 
And there are also important cultural differences that are, you know, more similar to the kind of cultural difference between, um, you know, in one group of humans, uh, once you get married, you go live with a uh, family of a bride and another group of humans, after you get married, you go and live with a family of a groom. That doesn't seem like a question of progress or whatever. It's just a question of, well, they have different customs that are carried forward throughout the generations. Yeah, yeah. No, not that kind of customs, but um, there are fashions, for example. So, so that, that's well documented is that sometimes a chimpanzee group uh, develops a fashion. And, and for example, there was one group uh, where the females put grass in their ear and walked around the whole day with grass in their ear. And then uh, very soon all of them started doing it. Um, females more than males. Females always do more self or ornamentation than the males do uh, so so yeah we but not customs like who you marry or who you have sex with or that kind of things no i don't think that's the case but you do have for example groups where um that is that are more peaceful than other groups or more aggressive than other groups and so um there are documentations of that of, of, of two groups of the same species where one of them is extremely peaceful and manages to keep that peace and the other one is more aggressive. So I think you have social differences like that, but not in terms of the customs of uh, who you, you're going to marry. And so that, that's not, of course, a, something that the primates do anyway, like marrying. So when one group is more peaceful than the other, um, uh, presumably it's been ruled out in some way that this is genetic, that it's sufficiently close to each other genetically, that that can't be the be, be explanation. Um, how, what is the cause of that? Do we have a, a model for what causes one group to be more peaceful and, uh, uh, and do they then sustain that just because they're in one kind of equilibrium and the other group has ended up in a different kind of equilibrium? How do we think about, uh, how that comes about and what, what does that teach us? Well, there's an observation by, uh, Robert Sapolsky on his baboons is that one of his baboon troops lost the most aggressive males. Uh, due to poisoning at some garbage dump or something. And uh, so all of a sudden, the most aggressive males were gone and the, the group became much more peaceful. And that's, of course, understandable. There's, there's no big mystery of how that may happen. But then the group kept the peace for the next 10 years, even though there were males coming in and males going out, which is typical of baboon troops. Uh, and so his speculation was that the fact that they kept it going for 10 years, the more peaceful circumstances is because the females were selective in what kind of males they admitted to the group uh, and that the females had decided that a more peaceful group was pleasant and 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 was something that they wanted so so it was not a genetic difference but it was maybe selectiveness of the females in this particular case oh interesting that sounds like a plot of some greek play by aristophanes or something um the um uh what um uh, you know, one thing that people like to uh, think through when we look at uh, non-human primates is a way of reflecting on our own nature, on in particular how moral we are, whether we're biologically hardwired to be moral, or biologically hardwired to be selfish. And I think a lot of, you know, this is obviously an important question and it's an obvious question to ask in this context, but a lot of thinking about this is very flabby. So, um, you know, what are the wrong assumptions that people make about what we can learn about morality and human nature from studying these non non human primates? And uh, what do you think the actual lesson is? Well, I got in interested in the evolution of morality because I worked on empathy in the primates, and so the first studies of empathy were mostly about. Um, uh, what you would call reactions to the distress of others. So, so let, let's say you see you see a child crying, you you console them, and and that's an act of empathy, uh, and you help them uh, if necessary. And um, chimpanzees and bonobos do exactly the same thing. If if one of them has lost a fight or has fallen out of a tree or whatever, distresses them, others come over and embrace them and kiss them and and try to calm them down. So I got interested in acts of empathy, and very soon I discovered that uh, for many people, empathy is very close to morality. Uh, for the Dalai Lama, of course, compassion is, is all you need. You don't need much else for morality than compassion. Uh, I, I think morality is probably more than that, but uh, empathy is a very important feature. And without empathy, you cannot be a moral being because empathy is what 
draws you into others. You're interested in others. How can you be a moral being if you're not interested in others? And so um, I got interested in the evolution of morality and noticed that um, there's a lot of top-down theory in, in evolution of morality. It's like very Kantian. It's like it's a rational decision to be a moral being uh, and, and we reason ourselves towards moral principles. I don't believe a word of that. I'm, I'm much more Jungian. Uh, David Hume assumed that the moral emotions are this, what he called the moral sentiments are at the basis of uh, human morality. And I think that's uh, exactly the case. And, and, and it is built on a primate morality and a primate um, empathy, uh, primate psychology, basically. And, and so I think human morality is not some sort of invention that is independent of biology. Uh, I do think it goes beyond what, what chimps and bonobos do. I think it's, it's more complex than what they do. Um, but it's clearly related to what they do. So the existence of empathy seems like a good piece of news. Um, uh, you know, the, the basic instinct that we seem to have or the basic tendency we seem to have in, in, in both human and non-human primates to see uh -huh. a member of our species suffer and think, is there something we can do to help them? Is there something we can do to um, make them less, less upset? Um, but at the same time, you also see the continuity of of, of fights, of uh, uh, you know, small forms of war. Um, so, so you know, how reassured should we be by the existence of empathy in these non-human primates, and how does empathy interplay with aggression, with status seeking, uh, with with dominance, and all the other kinds of moral passions uh, that humans also seem to share with primates? Yeah, 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 yeah. We have all of that, and uh, when humans are nice to each other, they're actually nicer and more altruistic than any primate I know. And when we're nasty to each other, we are worse than any primate I know. Because, for example, we have genocides, which which is not something that other primates do. So um, we have these extremes in our psychology. And you cannot say that humans are by definition nice or humans are by definition nasty. We are both. And, and we alternate between the two, dependent on the circumstances and dependent on what we are being told by the politicians and so on. Oh, that's and very interesting the other because sometimes people compare these different primate species by sort of which of them tend to be more peaceable and which of them tend to be more aggressive. But what you're saying is that, uh, if I understand you right, what really puts humans apart is not where they fall on that scale from, you know, niceness to nastiness, to put it simplistically, uh, but it's rather, it's not a point estimate, it's the variance, mm -hmm. that humans yeah, just yeah. have higher variance than non-human primates. That's really interesting. Yeah, we, we have extremes, but the same thing you see in, in chimpanzees and bonobos. So bonobos are generally nicer than chimps, less violent. Uh, actually, we don't know of, of one bonobo killing another bonobo, and we know plenty of examples of that in chimpanzees, both in the field and in captivity. So, um, but all, all these species, they have that same spectrum. It's not as wide maybe, but they have that same spectrum that they can be extremely aggressive under certain circumstances and they can be extremely nice. And, and so I think I, I would not simplify these things. I can understand why some people want to be more like a bonobo like a, than like a chimpanzee. I can understand that there's also sexual reasons for that, of course, um, but um, the, the same sort of spectrum you see in all species. And what determines, uh, you know, when we are empathetic and when we are aggressive? Is there a set of common factors um, that you see between humans and non-human primates? And is there something we can learn from that about how to set up cultures, societies, uh, political structures in ways that will encourage cooperation and niceness rather than than conflict and aggression? Well, the thing with empathy is that empathy is very biased. Empathy is aroused more by individuals who are familiar and similar. So, so in humans, that, that means individuals of, of your same tribe, so to speak, of your, your same culture, same language, same color, everything is similar. Um, and, and this is true now, there's empathy studies on rodents, on dogs, on primates, on all sorts of animals. We do empathy studies nowadays and, and they're always biased. They, are, they always have this social bias built in, which means it's hard to generate empathy for individuals who are quite different from you. 
who, who are distant or a, a different ethnic group of different language, that becomes more difficult for you. And so uh, empathy is, is a bit narrow. And that's also why some people have objected to it as the, the basis of morality. They say it's too narrow for that. Morality needs a broader basis. Uh, but the fact that we have it um, is very important. And, and once you have it, once you have empathy, the capacity for it, you can expand it. You can try to mentally expand it. And we do that actually. We humans, we are busy doing that. So, so for example, in our moral systems, I, I always take the example of the Geneva Conventions. The Geneva Convention is that you need to treat your enemies well. Well, I, I don't think any primate would come up with the Geneva Convention uh, because it, it goes against that narrowness of empathy. Uh, but we, we try to expand the rules for our human moral systems. And, and, that, and that's a cognitive capacity that we have and the, why we try that. So influenced a little bit by the work of primatologists like you and, and a lot by social psychologists like Jonathan Haidt, um, old friend of a podcast. Um, uh, I, I've written my own work about uh, the groupishness of, of human beings, of the way in which we are capable of extreme altruism and, and courage in helping and defending those who we think of as members of our own group, but also the extreme yeah, yeah. cruelty of which we can treat members of the out group. Um, you know, one fundamental question is always how malleable are the lines between in-group and out-group, right? So in a human society, um, is it always going to be the case that if you're of a different ethnicity, I will just tend to think of you as a member of the out-group? Or can we build these successful multi-ethnic nations in which we say, no, actually what is salient is that we're Dutch or what is salient is that we're Americans and we've redefined over time the meaning of those terms in such a way that they, uh, you know, in a fundamental way, improve, uh, include people from, from different ethnic groups. What do you think the evidence from your field of study is about how easy it is to move those lines? Um, you know, is empathy... You know, if you're around somebody for a long enough time, if they seem to be part of your pack, if you're part of your group, then you can come to be very empathetic to them, even if you're not biologically related to them, even if they are from a sort of more distant group. Or do you think that uh, those sort of fundamental biological facts of kin relation are so baked in that you worry that it's also going to be the case in a human context? Yeah. What is different about humans is that is the scale of our societies. So we have societies of thousands, millions of people. Uh, in the primates, the group is, is the individuals that you know, that you live with and that you know. There are no anonymous individuals that you consider part of your group. So um, it's, it's very limited. It's, it's usually 100 individuals maximum. Uh, and that's your group. And you're, you're nasty to the other group, but you're nice to your, your own group. Uh, that's a general rule in, in other animals too. Um, the interesting thing once happened uh, with a group in, in, in Africa, uh, chimpanzees, that was studied by Jane Goodall, and she describes that process, where they were one group, but they split. And after they split, so here you have individuals who have grown up together, they have played together, they, they know each other extremely well, but the group split and they became enemies. And, and a couple of years later, they started killing each other. So all of a sudden, these individuals who knew each other start to redefine the other as a member of the other group. And, and, uh, and so that's a possibility in the chimpanzee is that, that you kill members of another group, even though you know them individually and you've lived together with them. But it's all on a much smaller scale than in human society because we have markers for group membership. Uh, we, the way you dress, the way you talk, we, we have markers that you don't see in, in the other primates. And so the scale of our enterprise is very different in, in human society. And so the, the intergroup processes are not exactly the same, but it's the same rule as that members of your own group, you treat very differently than members of the other group. Um, the example you just gave made me think of a very human tendency, which is to treat apostates worse than mm -hmm. members of actual outgroups. Um, and you yeah, know, this yeah. is something that you see in some of the earliest writings on religious toleration, um, where advocates of religious toleration say, who are Christians say, well, you know, Jews and Muslims, we should tolerate them. I mean, they're just sort of, you know, they got it wrong, they're confused, and 
you know, uh, but, but that's fine. We should let them be. But of course, people who had received the good word of Jesus Christ and, and who were Christians and then they become apostates and they embrace different religion or different denomination, you know, that we really cannot tolerate. And it goes, of course, all the way through to today where often the, uh, the near enemy politically is more uh, passion inducing than the far enemy where, uh, you know, people yeah. on, on the left sometimes have greater hatred for, you know, a more moderate left-wing person than for the people who are actually on, on the political right. So that, that does seem to yeah, be yeah, a, a yeah. resonance here in human societies. Yeah, that's very, that's very common. You know, I, I grew up in the Netherlands where we had Catholics and Protestants, a bit like in, in Ireland. Well, what is the difference between a Catholic and a Protestant? It's actually very small. They believe in the same Christ and the same God and everything, the Bible and so on. So the difference is extremely small, but they are um, they can hate each other just as, just as badly as anybody else. Yeah. So bonobos are sometimes held out to be this sort of, you know, they're the... They're the lovely species, right? They're the more peaceable species, and so on. Um, do the does the distinction between in group and out group work exactly the same way? It just has a little less severe consequences, or are there differences in how they draw those uh, distinctions? Always the whole idea of bonobos is particularly peaceable, sort of wrong to start off with. Well, an interesting thing with bonobos is that the the groups sometimes mingle. So, so in chimpanzees, that's not a possibility. Chimpanzees have different degrees of hostility between the groups, but never friendship or good relationships. Uh, bonobos mingle. And, and so in bonobos, the females are in charge. The females are dominant over the males collectively, not individually, but collectively. And the females decide that they want to meet other females of other groups. They're going to do that. The males may not be entirely happy with that. And the males actually... Uh, show some signs of territoriality, but the females um, mingle with other uh, and share food sometimes and sometimes adopt even offspring of other females in other groups. And so it's interesting for us as humans, if we contemplate uh, our evolutionary history, people always focus on the chimpanzee and, and especially anthropologists are very happy with the chimpanzee. Uh, they are male dominated, they're violent, they have intergroup uh, warfare going on. Um, the anthropologists are very, yeah. The, the anthropology is very happy with them because their scenarios of human evolution are often based on humans being warriors, which is very male oriented. And so um, the bonobo is often pushed to the side. The bonobo is too peaceful and too sexy for the taste of the some anthropologists. And um, I think the bonobo needs to be brought in into every discussion, and my last book is on gender, the gender discussion, they need to be brought in. They are exactly equally close to us as the chimpanzee. They have a very different sort of social organization, a very different kind of behavior. And um, the brothers show us that peaceful intergroup relationships are also possible. And, and sometimes, you know, at the moment, there is a tendency in anthropology to emphasize that humans stand out because we cooperate between groups, and that's very special, they say. But actually, that's uh, something that the bonobos do too. That's very interesting. Um, so you mentioned your last book on 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 gender. Um, uh, you know, what can we learn about the nature of the role of biological sex and the nature of the social construct of gender in humans by looking at the behavior of non-human primates? Yeah, there's two things. One is that in the other primates too, I think you can speak of gender in the sense that they learn certain aspects of their sex roles from each other. And, and so uh, the males, they watch the young males, they watch the adult males, the young females, they watch their mother or other adult females, and they follow their example. And so in a way, there is also a cultural transmission of how you behave as a male and how you behave as a female. And in that sense, I think um, gender is a concept that can be applied to other species as well. The second thing that we learn and, people and is that just to go that. back to a question I had earlier, is there variation in those kind of gender roles between groups? So is it true that yeah. in one colony of bonobos, what it is to be, uh, uh, you know, a female bonobo, the, the kind of expected gender role of what standard of behavior you should live up to is significantly different from what it would be like in a different colony of bonobos? I, I don't think I don't think we have solid evidence for that, but you would expect it if, because because we do know that there is biased learning going on. For example, a recent study of uh, orangutans in the forest showed that 
Young females eat exactly the same foods as their moms, exactly the same diet. And young males, they, they vary and they eat sometimes foods that the mother never touches. And that's because they take the example for, for them, the models are the adult males that they see on occasion eating. And so um, we do have evidence that there is biased learning going on. And so you would expect uh, that kind of variation that you ask about, but I don't think we have well documented that. But, but I wanted to say the second thing that we learn about gender, and people don't always expect that, is that there's as, as much gender diversity, I think, in other primates as, a, as there is in humans. So, for example, homosexual behavior, of course, um, is, is very common in the primates. In bonobos, I, I, I call bonobos usually bisexual because I don't think they make a big distinction between whether they have sex with a male or a female. And so, uh, but in other species, you see maybe less, but you still see uh, quite a bit of homosexual behavior. You see individuals who don't fit the typical roles. So you see uh, males who don't play the macho game and don't want to be the dominant male necessarily and stay out of all this politics that's going on. And you see females, I described, for example, in my book, a female named Donna, who a female chimpanzee who was born as a female, but the older she got, the more she acted like a male. And then she grew into a figure which looked like a male. And she associated a lot with the males. And, and, and I cannot ask her her gender identity but I bet she was identifying as a male. That's how it looked to me. So, so all that gender diversity that we have in human society of transgender people, of homosexual orientation and so on, all that diversity we can see in the other primates. And the interesting part is that they have no trouble with it. I've never noticed that they exclude an individual because of this. So, so, so the tolerance level is a lot higher than in most human societies, uh, but the variation is very similar, I think. And so what does that tell us about the role of the, the concept of biological sex and gender, right? I mean, an extreme reading of what you just said would uh, imply that therefore, uh, you know, human notions of biological sex are overly simplistic. We should get rid of the idea of a biological sex bi binary. Everything is gender all the way down. But I, I take it that's not what you're saying, right? So so no. what, what, should, what, what conclusion should we draw from these really interesting observations that you just make? Well, I think, I think sex is mostly binary. 99% or so of the individuals are either male or female. And there's a small slice of individuals who is in between. Uh, gender is, of course, a very different way of thinking about it. It's, gender is a cultural construct. And, and, and I usually divide it not in male and female, but in masculine and feminine and everything in between. It's an extremely variable concept. Uh, and as I said, it, it's probably applicable to other primates as well, even though maybe less well than in humans, but in humans it's very important to distinguish those two. And uh, I think there are sex, sex differences that are universal. There are sex differences that we see in all human societies and in all primate societies. So it's very hard to argue with some sort of biological background. So for example, all young males, in all primates, also in humans, boys, like to wrestle. When they're young, they do mock fighting. They, they run around to try to fight, wrestle each other down. Um, in the young primates, th this is a very big bias. The, the males like to do that, the females don't like to do that necessarily. And that's why the, the females often play separately from the males. Uh, and in all human societies, this has been documented. Another thing that's universal in play behavior is that in all primate societies, all human societies, young females are more interested in infants and dolls. If you give a doll to a, a group of chimps, it's always a female who's going to pick it up and care for it. If, if a male picks it up, he may he may take it apart and to look inside the doll <laughs> to see what's in there. Uh, but the females will put it on their belly, on their back, uh, walk around with it, uh, care for it. And, and, and they do the same thing with the infants of other females. Um, and so they become babysitters at some point. And that's also a universal human bias, a primate bias, the interest of young females in infants. And, and it's very logical because later in life, they, they, most of their life, they will spend caring for offspring. So there's different ways of thinking about gender, right? And one of them, the sort of, uh, let's say, the, the sort of naive feminist position, I say this with, with some love for my mom and other strong women in my life, who I think at some point in life perhaps held some, some version of that view, which is to say, you know, 
uh, sort of as biological sex, but the way that people then behave in society is just completely a construct of culture. And the fact that boys like to play with cars and girls like to play with dolls is just because that's, you know, how the media portray it and children should portray it. And so then kids take the kind of uh, model from that. And then there's another kind of concept of gender, which has no, you know, the way you express the, the biological sex binary is obviously different culturally from one place to another, but, it's, but, 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 um, and it's influenced by our culture and so on, but, but that doesn't deny the influence of biology. I, I you, you make a similar distinction in your work. Tell us through sort of, walk us through what taking seriously the concept of gender should mean and, and what it shouldn't mean, where, where we start to go beyond, yeah. uh, what the concept can helpfully do for us. So what people very often want to do is they want to choose between biology and culture. And that's why you get these discussions with some people who say it's all cultural. Uh, there is nothing that, that is all cultural. That doesn't exist. Because what is culture? Culture is us. Culture is us influencing each other. And we are biological organisms. So you have biological organisms influencing other biological organisms. Automatically, biology is in there. So there is no pure culture, it doesn't exist. There's no pure biology either, it doesn't exist. And that's why we in biology, we don't speak of, about instincts anymore in animals because everything an animal does is influenced by how, how it grew up and what it learned in its lifetime and so on. And so um, there is no pure biology either. So people wanna choose between the two and, and it's a false, sense of security that they have that they can do that but you cannot do that and so everything we do is influenced by two factors the environment and our genes and the interaction between the two and i think that that's one of the lessons you get if you if you look at the behavior of other primates and humans is that nothing is simple P people think that if you look at the other primates you see biology i don't think that's the case you see also a lot of cultural learning there um, and so I guess define the sensible concept of gender for us. How should we think about gender in a way that is true to the biology um, or true to the science and, and that can help us make sense of our own societies as well as perhaps of non-human non, non, non primates? Yeah, gender has to do with how you express uh, your sexuality and, and your, your sex role and, and how much you, you follow it or don't follow uh, the dictates of your culture. Uh, gender, of course, changes over time, changes from place to place. Um, at the moment, we are in a big change on gender uh, in that men are getting much more involved in family care and, and being involved in the family. And that's a flexibility that actually uh, I see also in the other primates. So, so for example, chimpanzees and bonobo males, they don't do anything with, with the young. The, the females do everything. The males may protect them on occasion, but that's about all they do. But we know that if a mother loses her life in the forest and all of a sudden there is an orphan, we know that sometimes males pick up these orphans and carry them and, and they, they adopt them, not just for a couple of days. Uh, High-ranking males, like an alpha male, may adopt a, a baby chimp for five years and, and take care of it. So they have that tendency, they have that capacity. It's not always expressed. Um, and, and this is true for many animals, actually. The, male, the males may not do much, it's true for rats also. The males may not do much with the young, but if there's no females around and the young are asking for attention, the males will take care of them. So that's very interesting is in relation to what is happening in human society at the moment, where men are getting more involved in childcare and the conservative pundits on TV, they say, you know, why should we care about uh, paternal leave? Because it's, it's a female um, job to take care of the offspring, look at the other animals. It's not entirely true. I think, I think that capacity for caring for the young exists uh, in many males. And, and what we're doing in society now is bringing that out and, and relying on it. So this is a complete tangent, but it came up to me when you, when you talked about finding uh, you know, uh, a young of the same species in in the forest and taking care of it. And I thought, well, what if it was of a different species? And and suddenly I had a, a thought popped in my mind: Do non-human primates keep pets? Is there 
uh, you know, what are forms of uh, interspecies co co cooperation? Clearly, humans have forms of quite significant interspecies co cooperation, as well as very extreme forms of interspecies exploitation. Um, are there examples of this in, in bonobos or chimpanzees or, or other primates? Yeah, I think in captivity that happens. But of course, in captivity, the animals are very well fed and well taken care of. And um, they don't have the pressure of finding food the whole day. Uh, in the wild, I don't say. I, I, I think they sometimes may be nice to the young of other species, uh, but of course they also sometimes will eat them. Uh, on the but because you know chimpanzees they eat meat, so so it, it depends on the circumstances. But they have less freedom, I would say, than the captive primates in that regard. And and humans live in this sort of same circumstances. We have we have enough food and and security in our societies that we can adopt pets. But um, if we lived on the on the brink, I'm not sure we would do that so much. I have a, a, a completely pet theory, which uh, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not a biologist, and it's it's, it's just a silly theory I, I made up, thinking, reflecting on the differences between squirrels in the United States and in Europe, and and the theory is that you know, if you have very tame squirrels in a country, it shows that you haven't had a famine in many centuries. Um, but there must be you know <laughs> some some mechanisms like that where you know. Um, to have real forms of, you know, keeping a pet obviously is a luxury phenomenon in the sense that it means you don't have to prioritize every calorie for yourself or your own family members because otherwise humans would presumably usually choose to do that. Yeah, the predators are also a little bit different in in the US. I'm not sure you have as many martens as you have in the, in Europe, and, and that's the enemy of of the squirrel there, you know. Yeah, I mean, as I'm saying, I'm not, I'm not pushing this as a serious. I, I'm spreading misinformation on this particular point. Um, uh, uh, help me think through two larger conceptual issues um, uh, where I think social scientists, um, as well as just people who are not scientifically trained, um, often uh, have different instincts from natural scientists. Um, and that's uh, uh, evolutionary biology, and then you know a little bit more nature and nurture. Um, uh, you know, there is a kind of reluctance among many, uh, you know, intellectuals uh, to uh, think in terms of evolutionary biology. Um, in part because I think they don't like to think of humans as being in any way determined by our nature. They want to think that uh, Stephen Pinker and, and and others have shown that. Um, you know, there's a kind of blank slatism where it just feels uh, more uh, progressive or more appealing to say we're not constrained by our nature in any way. In part, perhaps also because there's some really bad arguments from evolutionary biology made in the public realm. And so it's easy to 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 push back against the whole thing. What do you think the role of evolutionary biology should or shouldn't be in reflecting on on the world and, and on human societies and thinking through uh, 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 through who we are and how we act? Yeah. yeah, I think in the social sciences um, and in philosophy, the humanities in general, uh, there is still an attitude that I call um, neo-creationism. So they, um, they, they accept evolution. Evolution has occurred also for humans, but it has stopped here. Our head, our mind, as something else. So, so you're so gesturing that, towards your towards your your throat. So yeah. it's got sort of everything from the head yeah, down it, is evolution, but everything yeah, from, from the head, from the head down. Itself. From the head down, we are evolved primates, but uh, our mind is something totally different. And uh, that's an illusion. Uh, I know the evolution, of course, includes everything, including the brain. Um, but uh, they tend to believe that and they cling to that, and and it's of course a traditional position in the West is that the humans are something special. Uh, and, and, and initially this was supported by all sorts of research. And also in the previous century, I must say, the studies of animal behavior were extremely simplistic. They were dominated by Skinner and, and his rats who pressed levers and stuff like that. And that's, that's all we saw of what they did. So they had a very simplistic view of animals and that supported the view that humans were very special. Uh, but now we have all these cognitive studies on animals that are really coming up at the moment. And, and that started about 25, 30 years ago um, with, with massive studies. And uh, it becomes 
ever more difficult to maintain that humans are special because basically everything we do can we can see some examples of in other species and so i i do think that we um we need to free ourselves of this very uh, anthropocentric bias that we have uh, i i call it anthropo denial so so since we always get insulted we who work on animal cognition of being anthropomorphic um, of, of being undue in our um, assumptions about uh, primate behavior, let's say, as being human-like, uh, I invented this word anthropodenial, which is the opposite, is that you deny the connection with other species and you can deny the connection of them with us. Um, and I think it's a very dangerous attitude. It, it has given us, for example, uh, at the moment we have we post-COVID, let's say, the COVID crisis and the climate crisis are both crises of humans overestimating how we are separate from nature. We, we, we think we can do anything we want with the planet. We can, we can eat bats, we can pollute the oceans, all, everything is fine. So th there's a certain humility that I think humans need to learn is that we are part of nature. We are part of biology. We're part of evolution, uh, including our wonderful mind, which is, which is great <laughs> as it is. Uh, but it's still part of uh, evolution. And, and so that idea that we, we stand outside and, and we are different from everything else, that's an old religious idea that I think we need to drop. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, it's interesting because I think it comes from two different directions, right? There's this old religious idea that humans are somehow special and our head is not just driven by our bodily uh, you know, instincts and cravings and so on. And so we want to sort of create this space which is safe from... Uh, nature and safe from evolution and we are just you know these uh cartesian dualistic beings who can you know we're free to act as they wish in the world without any kind of input from from biology there's also i think for a real resistance towards explanations that have to do with evolution more from a kind of more lefty or progressive perspective right where like well the moment we talk about evolution biology we talk about alpha males and this and that and you know, that's just all justifying traditional societies. And so therefore we end up being really skeptical of um, of evolution biology. When I think of some of my friends who are skeptical of evolution biology, it tends to come more from that direction, right? Um, so how do you yeah. respond to that? Is it partially in complicating social narratives of something? I know you've worked on this, where you know what sometimes written in newspapers about alpha males just isn't actually what you find in your research on alpha males. And so perhaps... A better understanding of these phenomena uh, in the natural world would then also make it easier to take seriously those arguments from evolutionary biology because they're sort of you know the resistance against them is based on 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 a caricature of what evolutionary biology would actually imply. Yeah, that's maybe also related to the fact that traditionally, the bad side of human nature, uh, like war fair aggression uh, being alpha males because alpha males are depicted as bad even though i don't think they're as bad but but the bad side of human nature but, but tell, tell us tell us about that for a moment before you go into the larger answer why 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 are alpha males yeah well that and why are they not bad i know this goes back to some of your earlier work i think three quarter of them are really good leaders good alpha males they do much more than being the boss of the group they, they keep the peace they keep the group together they show a lot of empathy for others they they can become extremely popular and loved by the group because they are good leaders. And so I think what, what they do in the business world, they have all these books about how to be an alpha male. And what they mean is how to be a bully and how to let everyone know that you are the boss. Uh, that's not really what I consider uh, the typical alpha male in a primate society. So, so but, but the tendency of people has been to the bad side of human nature, we shove into biology. That's biology. The good side of human nature is something that we do. We call it humane, we, our humane behavior. And, and so I would say peacemaking, empathy, uh, paternal care, uh, maternal care, all these things are also biology. And, and so maybe what your leftist friends are saying is that um, we don't like evolutionary biology because it reminds them usually of all the negative things that we humans do. But um, evolutionary biology is also involved in all the positive things that we do. And so you cannot get around it. Uh, and, and, and we have a tendency from, from old days, struggle for life, to depict nature as a place of competition. 
uh, where only bad things happen, but that's really not uh, the nature that I know and, and the nature that we, uh, we are sort of reducing nature by saying that. Um, let me ask you a, a personal question at the end. You, you know, have spent a lot of your scientific career working very closely uh, with uh, these non-human primates. Um, what does that feel like? How much mutual understanding communication do you think you can get? Does it feel like, uh, you know, if you think it's not a mistake to anthropomorphize them, does it feel like you have genuine friends who are non-human primates? Um, tell us a little bit about the, the, the personal side of what it is like working with, uh, with these animals. Yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've worked all my life in captivity uh, in large zoos and, um, at, the, at the primate center here where we have an outdoor facility, a uh, field station. But of course, as, as someone who works in captivity, I'm very close to the primates. I, I know them all by name uh, and, and I, I work with them every day. And, um, and what we usually do is most of it is observation of, of their social life. But sometimes we bring them into a room and we do a certain cognitive test on them with computers or something like that. And for all of that, I need their cooperation. I, I, uh, I need a good relationship with them. Otherwise, uh, there's no point in trying these things. And um, yeah, they are. some of them are friends. Some, some of them I've known for 25 years uh, or longer. Uh, so, so for example, I describe in one of my books, the female mama, uh, alpha female of the Arnhem Zoo colony. Uh, who is a very important figure and, and she's been alpha female for 40 years and I've known her for 40 years. And of course, each time I would come there, which is maybe once a year or so, she would recognize me, I would recognize her and, and we, would, we would have some talk together, so to speak. So yeah, some of them are friends and clearly uh, very close to me. Uh, and, and so when, when they die, like mama died a couple of years ago, that, that's also very... Uh, difficult moment uh, because you, you lose a friend basically at that moment. Yeah. Hans de Waal, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you.